welcome everyone. Let's let's begin uh, this uh, maths presentation. I am one of the uh, lecturers in School of Maths, and uh, my goal in this half an hour is to give you some uh, ideas about uh, what uh, studying maths uh, may be about. It's a difficult task because, uh, in many ways, uh, the best recipe to uh, approach maths on the university level is to uh, forget all the strategies and methods that you have been learning in high school because, uh, uh, well, the way they teach maths in high school uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, it's, it, it, it works for high school but it has very little to do with actual uh, 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 research level mathematics and mathematics that can be, can be useful for reality. Uh, and uh, so uh, my uh, uh, task uh, to give you idea of that kind of mathematics is somewhat uh, tedious. Uh, uh, I'll try uh, nevertheless. And first, uh, uh, I want to uh, uh, spend a couple of minutes indicating uh, some uh, um, interesting things about maths that will not be the focus of this talk. Uh, and for that, I'll refer to a song of a mathemati American mathematician, uh, Tom Lehrer, who, uh, if you haven't heard of him, you certainly should uh, check uh, him uh, um, out after this talk. There are several recordings on YouTube that you can uh, listen to, and uh, mostly not about maths, just all sorts of uh, humorous and satirical pieces. But this one is actually about math, so let's uh, uh, spend a couple of minutes listening to that. Counting sheep when you're trying to sleep being fair when there's something to share being neat when you're folding a sheet That's math or math off of a wall when you cook from a recipe book when you know how much money you owe that's mathematics how much gold can you hold in an elephant's ear when it's noon on the moon then what time is it here if you could count for a year would you get to infinity or somewhere in that vicinity choose how much postage to use when you know what's the chance it will snow when you bet and you end up in debt oh try as you may you just can't get away from mathematics tap your feet keep in time to a beat of a song while you're singing along harmonize of the guys Yes, try as you may You just can't get away from mathematics Okay uh, uh, So uh, Yes, uh, it's always a, a bit of a disaster trying to play back audio files in this lecture theater, so if you miss some of the words, make sure to check them afterwards. Um, right, now, uh, however, uh, all these uh, and uh, other lovely applications of uh, mathematics is not uh, what I'm going to uh, talk about, mainly because um, it's... There is a funny discrepancy here that uh, the applications of mathematics that are the easiest to uh, grasp as in their usefulness in everyday life uh, take actually quite a while of uh, hard work to develop the relevant maths that you use uh, f f for that maths. Maybe one of the most striking applications uh, and fairly recent one also is, well, when um, uh, you uh, interact uh, with an ATM machine and key in the pin code. Well, it's, of course, very uh, good to be sure that uh, this information that you communicate to the ATM is not being stolen by, any, uh, by anyone else so that they cannot access your bank account. And uh, this particular application of mathematics, security of that sort, uh, relies on mathematical methods and discoveries that uh, uh, were considered 
way too abstract and pointless as recently as about 50 or 60 years ago. And then suddenly uh, someone realized that they can be used for, uh, uh, for the purposes of security. So you really cannot, be, uh, cannot know in advance uh, uh, what kind of maths end up being used for what kind of maths ends being interesting. It's, uh, there, there are lots of uh, exciting things related to that. So let me try and uh, uh, spend the uh, next uh, few minutes uh, explaining to you how uh, two different ways of talking about maths, namely algebra and geometry, are actually doing all the same. Uh, it's conventional to think that uh, uh, for if you uh, look at all sorts of uh, uh, popular writings in mass media, they will say that you can say you can have either uh, uh, geometric uh, way of thinking where you think in terms of various shapes and figures and so on, or an algebraic way of thinking where you think in terms of symbols and formulas and so on. And uh, uh, so what I want to try to uh, convince you is that these two ways of thinking are actually not exclusive, that they actually are very intimately connected and benefit uh, one another. And uh, let me begin from this uh, very simple formula that you may remember from high school, a uh, formula for uh, evaluating uh, the square of the sum of two quantities a and b, a plus b square equals a square plus b, a to a b plus b square. And there are two different ways to justify this formula, to explain that uh, this actually is a true mathematical act. You can either approach it very algebraically. You can say that a plus b square is a plus b times a plus b and then patiently expand the brackets and obtain this formula. Not a difficult exercise. Uh, surely you uh, will have done that at some point by now. Alternatively, you can view it, look at it geometrically and draw uh, view a plus b square as the area of the square whose size is equal to a plus b, and then cut that square into four pieces, uh, a square of size a, a square of size b, and two rectangles with sides a and b, which, of course, instantly tells you that, indeed, the total square, which is a plus b square, the square of the size of uh, of, of the length of, of, of the side is equal to a square, the area of one square, plus b square, plus 2ab. So you have two squares and two rectangles. Uh, so uh, these two explanations are absolutely equivalent to one another. It's just that they are phrased in a very different way, in terms of symbols and in terms of drawings. But they are uh, equally convincing as mathematical explanations for that formula above. And, well, depending on which of these explanations you prefer, you may decide that you uh, are more algebraically or more geometrically inclined. Uh, so, well, let me show you some further examples to help you with deciding which, of the, uh, which type of reasoning you actually prefer. So uh, before that, I, I want to uh, uh, mention so, so, uh, uh, in relation to that uh, to, to the difference between two, between those two proofs, uh, a French uh, philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau actually uh, was quite interested in math in mathematics at various points, and he uh, was quite. A, impressed by that formula a plus b square equals a square plus 2ab plus b square, spend some time thinking about it. And well, I mean, we're talking maths, not French here, so let me give you the translation. Uh, so he, he wrote in his uh, famous book, uh, The Confessions, uh, mm, the first time I found by, by calculation that the square of a binomial was composed of the square of each part added twice the product of those parts, in spite of the correctness of my multiplication, I would not believe it until I had drawn the figure. So he definitely preferred the uh, geometric uh, line of reasoning, as you can see. But uh, and um, well, um, we shall see some other uh, amusing examples of the same geometric line of reasoning. Um, one first example, also quite famous for in, in terms of history of mathematics, I guess, 
uh, is uh, just finding the sum of the first uh, n uh, integers. For example, finding the sum of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way up to 100. Uh, there is a funny story related to this particular sum, uh, uh, which is about uh, one of the most uh, bright uh, German mathematicians of the uh, uh, 19th uh, century, Carl Friedrich Gauss. Uh, when he was a little boy, uh, his uh, primary school teacher, uh, wanting just to uh, have some uh, uh, relaxing time, uh, told uh, uh, the kids to compute the sum, uh, hoping that they will spend at least quarter an hour just adding those numbers patiently on, uh, in, 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 and, and, and finally arrive to some results. Uh, but uh, uh, somehow uh, Gauss uh, uh, was uh, already at that stage uh, a really clever little boy, and so he came up with a very simple reasoning that actually provide, uh, co uh, allowed him to compute a result just in a couple of minutes. So uh, the teach his teacher was still writing the question on the blackboard, and Gauss already computed the answer and proudly demonstrated it to the teacher. So this the neat trick that he used was to take the sum, reverse it, and add to itself. And then, of course, uh, uh, 100 plus 1 is 101, 2 plus 99 is also 101. So you add the sum to itself, you just, uh, all together, you end up with uh, 101 taken 100 times, which is very easy. So you just need to multiply 101 by 100 and divide by 2 to get the value for the original sum. Uh, so that's what uh, Gauss did. It was probably his uh, first uh, mathematical discovery, which was followed by a, a range of absolutely uh, stunning discoveries that completely changed some areas of mathematics in the 19th century. So uh, this approach has, uh, can be explained in a very nice geometric way, the, uh, saying that when you add consecutive integers, 1 plus 2 plus 3 and so on, you can uh, interpret uh, uh, the adding that sum as uh, putting one uh, cubic box, then two cubic boxes, three, four, and so on. And the idea of Gauss would be to take this assembly of boxes, take another one of the same size and put them together so that you form a rectangle. And actually, so I have something like that, so that maybe it is more convincing. So you take just one uh, uh, shape like that, which has one orange bo uh, box on top, then two yellow, three blue, four green, five red ones. And then you take one exactly the same and put them together, and you get a rectangular shape. So it's very easy to figure out how many boxes there are in a rectangular shape, and now you just need to divide by two. So that was the yeah, of course. Um, another uh, sum that you can compute using the exact same trick, but also using a slightly different uh, geometric uh, intuitive picture, is this uh, sum of squares of consecutive uh, sum sum of consecutive odd numbers: one plus three plus one plus, for example, ninety-seven, ninety-nine. Uh, so, of course, you can do exactly what Gauss did, uh, reverse that sum, add it to itself, and uh, uh, divide by two. So, uh, and you, you observe that the result in this case is equal to uh, 2,500, so 50 squared. But there is another elegant way of obtaining the same thing, would be to look at squares assembled out of corner layers like that. So this, so you, here you have one green box, then three yellow, uh, five blue, 
seven uh, red and nine orange boxes. And so you can see that the, each next layer consists of the, uh, of the next odd number, one, three, five, seven, nine, and so on. And this picture gives you a very convincing proof that when you add odd numbers together, then the total number is a perfect square because you just assembled square out of these corner shapes. So here there is this proof explained. And one example, one further example where you really need to come up with, with, a, with a somewhat uh, more elaborate and clever explanation is adding consecutive squares, 1 plus 4 plus 9 plus 16 plus 25 and so on. For example, up to 100 square. Uh, and Somehow uh, you will see that now you will, uh, it's not quite enough to look at rectangular and squ square shapes. We need to uh, use some geometric three dimensional reasoning. But before I show you that argument, let me, actually, well, let me explain you how this argument goes. You can view uh, this, uh, well, there, there, is, there is this. Uh, pyramid that they have in uh, the History Museum in Strasbourg, uh, which, uh, if you look at it carefully, actually s sort of comp exactly computes the kind of sum we're interested in. Because on the very top layer, you just have one cannonball, on th then the next layer, four, the next layer, it's a square of size three, nine cannonballs, then 16, then 25. So each layer of this pyramid is just a square made of the appropriate number of cannonballs. So you can view geometrically uh, computing that sum of consecutive squares as determining the number of cannonballs used in this pyramid. And I will do uh, something very similar to explain how to compute that sum. And well, uh, a, in order to create some nice and simple shape, which is easy to understand, I'll use pyramids which uh, uh, are sort of modeled on, on, on those configurations of cannonballs. So uh, pyramids made of uh, square layers uh, with um, uh, 1, 4, 9, 25, uh, 16, 25, and so on, uh, uh, small boxes in each layer. And it turns out what is absolutely remarkable, that if you take six pyramids of this shape, then you can put them together, assembling a rectangular box. And I have an example here uh, to make it more convincing. But so you can see what happens in this picture, that you, out of three pyramids of this shape, you can uh, assemble something that looks almost like a rectangular box. So it's a rectangular box with this small thing on top. And then you can put those two things uh, one on top of the other and assemble an honest rectangular box. Uh, individually, each of those things will look like that. So it's a rectangular box with a little bit extra. And then you can put them together forming a real box. And so this uh, tells you that 6 multiplied by the sum of squares, 6 because we have to use 6 pyramids to assemble that box, is equal to n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1. And these are the dimensions of the, of the rectangular box that we managed to assemble. So uh, in a, if we have a rectangle or rectangular box of three-dimensional shape and so on, it is very easy to compute its volume because we just multiply the dimensions all together. So let me explain to you how to use that formula that we just obtained for something uh, a little bit more practical. So for, exa for example, to compute the area under the parabola y equals to x squared uh, between 0 and 1. So we take this parabola 
And we try to do a very naive thing. We try to approximate it by many rectangles. We cut our, the segment from 0 to 1 into n equal pieces, and on, in each of those pieces we replace the segment of the parabola by the corresponding uh, rectangle. So, of course, it will not give us the exact area under the parabola, but we are hoping that once we uh, make uh, uh, the pieces smaller and smaller, once the number of pieces into which we cut the segment is larger and larger, uh, this will give us the closer and closer approximation to the area of the parabola. So the areas of those rectangles are, each of those rectangles is of width 1 over n, because we divided the segment from 0 to 1 into n equal pieces. And the height of each rectangle is, uh, the heights are 1 over n squared, 2 over n squared, and so on, because we're dealing with a parabola. Because at, at the point, uh, for example, 2 over n, the height will be 2 over n squared, because the parabola is, has the equation y equals x squared. And so we add up those areas, and after we bring this, these things to the common denominator, we see that, well, this sum, this total area is equal to the sum of squares divided by n cubed. And we just know what, sum of, what the sum of squares is equal to. It's equal to 1 sixth n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1. So this total sum of areas, the total area of our rectangles is 1 sixth times 1 plus 1 over n, 1 plus 2 over n. And this, of course, is approximately one-third when n is very large, because 1 plus 1 over n is approximately 1, 2 plus 1 over n is approximately 2. So you get 2 over 6, which is one-third. And uh, this computation uh, of the area under parabola is uh, very uh, important for all sorts of applications, and in particular, uh, uh, Archimedes uh, uh, actually performed a computation like that on many different occasions, because many problems in physics that he was aiming to solve actually were, were all getting reduced to computing the area under parabola. Even though uh, he was not possibly realizing that on each of those occasions he was actually solving the same problem again and again. Uh, so, in, uh, and uh, this somehow, uh, uh, to uh, put it uh, somewhat uh, less seriously and more humorously, that's the uh, somehow the difference between. Uh, mathematics and more applied sciences, that somehow uh, sciences that, that are too preoccupied with immediate applications uh, sometimes uh, ignore the fact that they keep solving the same problems again and again, whereas maths actually often concentrates more on the actual essence of the problem, and so uh, it's uh, easier to spot that you just have a particular problem that you solved, and then you can use it in many different instances. And um, uh, in some sense, you can say that uh, math is all about some sort of intelligent laziness, uh, 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 figuring out the range of problems that are already within reach, and, and, and then uh, being able to apply them in individual questions without the need of solving them once again. Let me uh, conclude with one example where uh, I would like to warn you that all those reasonings with uh, uh, lovely geometric figures, like uh, those reasonings that we discussed, can be dangerous if you are uh, not really uh, being careful enough. So here in this figure you have two shapes. You have a square 8 by 8 and a rectangle. 5 by 13, which look as though they're assembled of exactly the same pieces of uh, uh, two trapezoids and two uh, triangles. Uh, however, the area of the square 8 by 8 is equal to 64. The area of the rectangle, uh, 5 by 13, is equal by 65. So something certainly is wrong. Uh, these two things cannot be made out of exact same pieces. 
And in fact, if you look at this picture with a slightly better resolution, uh, you can discover what exactly is going on, that there is um, uh, some empty space in that 5 by 13 rectangle, which is not covered. But, uh, so when you actually prove something, uh, some mathematical fact by, by drawing pictures, you have to be careful that your pictures actually do represent the things that you are trying to prove. So in uh, it, uh, uh, that empty space is of area exactly one, and interestingly enough, it leads to some very important mathematical result which is used in uh, many quite advanced applications of mathematics, that in any example of this sort, the empty space will have uh, area exactly one. Uh, more precisely, if you have a parallelogram on the square grid which is empty, that is, there are no uh, grid points inside the parallelogram, you just have the four grid points which are the vertices, then the area of such a parallelogram is equal to one regardless of how long and thin that parallelogram is. So I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention.